from the guys who know what to do might help. Yeah. <clears throat> Scripture reading today is in First Peter two five through eight. <clears throat> you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices compatible to God's though Jesus Christ for scriptures it is it says see I lay a stone in Zion a chosen and precious cornerstone and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame now you who believe this stone is precious but to those who do not believe the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone a stone that causes men to stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. So be it. So this cornerstone named Jesus Christ, is he precious to you today? Father in heaven, we thank you that you would give your son to die for our sins. That you would, instead of destroying us because of our continued disobedience to you, instead you would send a Savior, your son, to lay down his life, to live on this earth as a vagabond, as one who didn't even have a home, a place to lay his head. And he came to heal to give us sight, to give us hearing, and to give us so more, to offer salvation through Him. And then He laid down His life willingly on the cross to save us. His offering was complete, and we just thank You for that. Lord, may we consider how precious Jesus Christ is and live a life that shows that. We thank You and praise You for what You've done and will continue to do until Jesus Christ returns and then forevermore. We pray this in His name. Amen. So yeah, I stopped the video there because that's as far as you should have read today. We've read through 1 Kings chapter 4 if you've been reading. If you haven't been reading, shame on you. <laughs> okay? Because you don't know as much as going on. In that video, it showed how on the deathbed that David and Solomon were plotting murders. And it showed one murder that they didn't really tell you all the story there. We'll talk about that in a minute. But from the scripture that Merle read, our lives, if you didn't notice from that scripture, are supposed to be living stones. What does that mean? If Jesus is the cornerstone, and you've seen the, heard the song we read and everything else, that He is the foundation. He is either a stumbling block for men, or he is the foundation that the wise man will build his house upon. And then his children will build on the stone that you laid. And then their children will build on it. And you're building a holy house of royal priests. Living stones. Do you get the scripture? Have you read your Bible reading? Is your life, as the scripture says, is it acceptable and pleasing to God. If you've read through the scriptures, then there should be some things that are kind of confusing to you. And today's reading is going to be really confusing to you. It's the Song of Songs. Your Bible might say the Song of Solomon. We don't know who the author is. But when you read it, you're going to find out that God's not mentioned one time in the book. In any form. It's a love story. That if you take the imagery there, you're like, this is a crazy love story. And you've got your little sheet that I've given you because I continue to try to give you things to spur you on. And you'll see the picture down in the bottom right-hand corner, I think, is where it's added this gruesome-looking character. It's built on the imagery that's there from, from that Song of Songs. Because we don't necessarily understand that, but in that day, they understood the metaphors. Just like uh, it was somebody told me one time that Lowell preached a lot about farming. I'm like, that's because he's going over Jesus' words. Because his parables were a lot about farming. We don't understand that as much today, but in that time that was a story that would have been familiar with them 
to give them a further teaching illustration. This Song of Songs is a love story of a man and a woman. The way that love is supposed to be passionate and enduring. We had a little small wedding here yesterday. And the couple didn't know whether the bride should march down the aisle, what music to play, anything else. Craziest thing I've ever seen because normally I'm told what all needs to be done. They spent so much preparation in planning the wedding and no time in the relationship. That was so refreshing. I don't know. <laughs> this is my first wedding, he said. I was like, great. And your last. He's like, yes, that's why we're doing it in God's presence. What a refreshing thought and what a beautiful day. Well, when you're reading Kings, you see David on his deathbed. And it says as you're reading it, well, let me just read it. <laughs> 1 Kings chapter 3, starting in verse 1. Solomon made alliance with Pharaoh. I don't want to be in 3 yet. I want to be in 1 or 2. Let me get my Bible out because I'm not there. <laughs> can I find Kings? Let's see if I can. Okay, in 1 Kings... So Kim, you don't have the verses, of course. Well, I haven't got there yet. I don't know where I'm going. Let's see. I do want to be in three. We're going to be in three first. Okay, we're going to start in three, Kim. Verse one. Solomon made an alliance with Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and married one of his daughters. He brought her to live in the city of David until he could finish building his palace and the temple of the Lord and the wall around the city. At that time, the people of Israel sacrificed their offerings at local places of worship, for a temple honoring the name of the Lord had not yet been built. Solomon loved the Lord and followed all the decrees of his father David, except Solomon too offered sacrifices and burned incense at the local places of worship. All right, well, when you get to three, you've seen what's gone on bef before that. You've seen that, that Adonai has already tried to take the throne from David, I mean, from Solomon. But David put Solomon on the throne. And then on his deathbed, you read that David says, Love the Lord. Love the Lord. Hold on to his decrees. Remember Deuteronomy 6. Love the Lord with all your heart, mind, body, soul. But you remember those guys that did me wrong? I had an oath with them. Well, I had an oath with God not to do anything with them. But my son, <laughs> you can do something with them. Now wait a minute. What? And that's why I stopped the video where I stopped the video. Because Solomon's son was more wicked than he was. What are we teaching our children if our lives are inconsistent? with our faith. David was a man after God's own heart. And Solomon was the wisest man who ever lived. Really? Well, I tried to help you explain with David because when you read and study him, you're like, how can David be a man after God's own heart? He has done this, this, this. And that's where we tend to look at things because we tend to check off things. But God sees the heart. And David is a great example because we can see continual failure and failure and failure and failure as a man. But we see that if we have a repentative heart and turn to God, that He will accept us, that our righteousness does not come from ourselves. Our righteousness comes from the only one who is righteous, Jesus Christ. So we need to build our lives on Him. Him being the cornerstone and us being living stones that our children can build their lives upon. How could David on his deathbed say, love the Lord with all your heart, but kill the guys who did me wrong? Now in that video, Adonai is in there. David never told Solomon to kill him. David did suggest that something should happen to Joab. He shouldn't go to his grave in peace. He suggested that, didn't suggest, he told him that Shimei, if I said it right, because I'm not looking in my Bible, 
that he should plan a bloody death for him. Who was Adonai? Adonai was Solomon's brother. Wait a minute, that story's familiar here. David with Bathsheba. We had covetousness, which turned to lust, which turned to cover up, which turned to murder. And then we see that in the next chapter that David's oldest son, the heir of the crown, had his lustful relationship, which leads to rape, which leads to hatred, which leads to his David's son who has all the looks, all the charm, all, all these things, all the things that in this world we would find attractive. He kills his brother, David's firstborn son. And then he tries to take the throne from his father, and he winds up being killed. Now here David is on his deathbed telling his son, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, but follow after the pattern I set for you and go start murdering people. And this is the wisest man who ever lived. But you know, he hasn't prayed for wisdom yet. I'll give him that. He used the wisdom that comes with man's thoughts. And even though he prayed that prayer, and even though he knew that if he would be obedient to the Lord's decrees, and even with the wisdom that God gave him, we still turn to idols. Now what if we do it differently, guys? What if we build a foundation on Jesus Christ, that our kids can build a foundation on us, that their kids can build a foundation on? Oh, we're back to the Old Testament, what it said originally, isn't it? that we should teach our children when we get up, when we go to bed, when we sit down, when we eat, and live a life consistent, obeying all the decrees and commands that the Lord our God has set for us that day. And if we do that, you're choosing blessings instead of cursings. You're, chil you're, chil you're choosing health. You're choosing long life for your children. You're, you're, Michaela, you must have did that because you're, you're doing a fruitful womb. <laughs> You're choosing all these good things that God blesses you with. And Scripture tells us that children are a heritage and a blessing from the Lord. That marriage was created before sin ever came into this world. And as you're reading Song of Songs, you'll say, wait a minute, as you're reading along. If you're trying to look through the lens of Jesus Christ, you'll say, you know what? This perfect love that's here, even the sensual desire and stuff, should be the desire that I have for my God because He loved me enough to send His only Son to die for my sins. Genesis says that Adam knew his wife. We understand that means intimately. They had children from this knowledge. But it also says the same word is used for that Adam knew God. Because see, the reason God ever created marriage was so that we could understand in a perfect relationship with someone else that it's just a glimpse of what we'll have with God if we'll do that. And then the children that come out of that will be such a blessing in everything. So everything that comes out of that relationship, how much more is God going to bless you when you have the right relationship with Him? Oh, but Adam and Eve sinned, right? And, the, and, and they had a child, and they bore Cain. What happened? They bore another child, Abel. Their firstborn son did what to their secondborn son? Killed him. Killed him. You see, the, I think there's a saying, and I don't think it's in here, that the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. So now Solomon first makes an alliance with Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and marries one of his daughters. If you read commentaries, 90-something percent of them are going to say there was nothing wrong with that. The reason being is because Scripture doesn't say there's anything wrong with that. Alan disagrees. <laughs> okay, Alan does. Because he hasn't prayed for his wisdom yet, he makes a political alliance as we go on and see that video, which there is more to become. It's to be continued, as Fred said. We'll see that he does the same thing in chapters 9 through 11. That he makes alliance after alliance after alliance. Because it's wise here, he doesn't trust 
the Lord is God. Oh, you might wonder what the title of this sermon is. It's fear, wisdom, love, and trust. Well, what do those have to do with anything? Well, if you haven't seen the pattern already, fear is the beginning of wisdom. Fear of the Lord your God, of who He is, that He reigns supreme in the universe, not just the world, not in a fallen world. He reigns supreme. He knows everything. He's in control of everything. He knitted you together in your mother's womb. He knows every hair on your head. He knows every sparrow that falls to the ground. We should fear Him out of awe. We were His creation. We should do what He created us for. But we have the choice to disobey Him, don't we? But with that choice of disobeying comes the choice of choosing redemption through Jesus Christ also. So as that fear in Him leads to wisdom, Solomon hadn't figured it out here. He made an alliance because he thought that would be okay. That that was wise to him. Now I won't have an enemy over here that's powerful also. We will be allies. But you still bring in the pagan culture. Maybe she converted, but there's nothing in Scripture that tells us that whatsoever. And as you read on, it looks very similar to when he falls dramatically and winds up with 600 wives. If he's the author of Song of Songs, how could he write about one intimate relationship? Maybe now he's getting God's wisdom, and through all of his failures, he's seeing what would have been truly wise. So that when he writes Ecclesiastes, that he can say, meaningless, meaningless, meaningless. Everything that life has to offer you, till you get to, con to the conclusion in chapter 13, I think it is, is meaningless. The only thing that's not meaningless is worshiping the Lord. That's what matters. And that means we live a life like we were created to live. And even more so if we understand about His love. That this God who loves us this much could send His only Son to die for our sins. So that perfect love, when we understand that, can drive out all fear of condemnation. So that we learn to trust God. In all of our ways, acknowledge Him. Put our trust and faith in Him. Not in man, not in circumstances so that we can face the cancers, that we can face the bad relationships, that we can face the deaths, that we can face whatever trouble it is, the loss of everything. Look at, go back if you need to read it, look at Joseph and how he endured and how God used him. How many times did he think, what in the world is going on in my life? But he stayed faithful. Look at Joshua, huh, the same name that is Jesus' name, the one that led his people into the promised land, you won't find where he ever stumbled and faltered. But now you see David on his deathbed saying, Love the Lord your God, but do this for me. How inconsistent. But it, still David was, don't lose the fact of that, because he did sin and he did turn from his wicked ways and ask God to examine his heart. He was a man after God's own heart. Solomon knew well our call to holiness. I want to read you Deuteronomy chapter 7 as a reminder. I'm reading from the NLT. It has the subtitle of the privilege of holiness. Let me say that again. The privilege of holiness. When the Lord your God brings you into the land you are about to enter and occupy, He will clear away many nations ahead of you, the Hittites, Girgashites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. You glad I didn't give you that one? These seven nations are greater and more numerous than you. When the Lord your God hands these nations over to you and you conquer them, you must completely destroy them. Make tr no treaties with them and show them no mercy. You must not intermarry with them. Do not let your daughters and sons marry their sons and daughters, for they will lead your children away from me to worship other gods. I try to teach my youth when I get to teach them. When you see that prepositional phrase, for, see what it's tied together to. These things that you do by driving them out, even though some people, how could the, a God do that? He's already passed judgment. He gave them plenty of time to, to repent. He will do the same thing when Jesus Christ returns. You will be either be a sheep or you will be separated as a goat. Plain and simple. He's given them every chance. And he says, destroy them, 
Verse 4, For they will lead your children away from me to worship other gods. Don't miss this. That's why we're to build that firm foundation on Jesus Christ, us being living stones. You lay one on top of another till you build the house. Okay? Verse 5, this is what you must do. You must break down their pagan altars and shout, shatter. Well, I didn't finish verse 4, sorry. Then the anger of the Lord, we need to get that one, will burn against you and he will quickly destroy you. Verse 5, this is what you must do. You must break down their pagan altars and shatter their sacred pillars. Cut down their asher or poles and burn their idols. For you are a holy people who belong to the Lord your God. All of the people on earth, the Lord your God has chosen you to be his own special treasure. The Lord did not set, his, did set, not set his heart on you and choose you because you were more numerous than other nations, for you were the smallest of nations. Rather, it was simply that the Lord loves you and he was keeping the oath he had sworn to, his, to your ancestors. That is why the Lord rescued you from such a strong hand from your slavery and from the oppressive hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And now we're making alliances with them. Understand, therefore, that the Lord your God is indeed God. He is a faithful, the faithful God who keeps his covenant for a thousand generations and lavishes his unfailing love on those who love him and obey his commands. But he does not hesitate to punish and destroy those who reject him. Therefore, you must obey all these commands, decrees, and regulations that I am giving you today. If you listen to these regulations and faithfully obey them, the Lord your God will keep his covenant of unfailing love with you as he promised with an oath to your ancestors. Now, kids that are in here, I guess I'm all looking right there. You know when your parents don't live up to what their faith is and they say, love the Lord your God, but don't obey him? Call them out. Okay? What if Solomon would have called out David that day? What a difference it would have made. Because number one, he wouldn't have gone and committed the murders after that. And David would have probably died in peace. Now, I don't know that David didn't die in peace. I'm not adding anything to Scripture. But if you're plotting murder in your heart, I don't see the peace in your heart that should be there. Just my thoughts again. I'll put that again. Alan's thoughts. So you don't take them any further than that. Okay? Verse 11 says, If you listen to these regulations and to faithfully obey them, the Lord your God will keep His covenant of, of unfailing love with you as He promised with an oath to your ancestors. He will love you and bless you. He will give you many children. He will give fertility to your land and your animals. When you arrive in the land He swore to give your ancestors, you will have large harvests of grain, new wine, olive oil, and great herds of cattle, sheep, and goats. You will be blessed above all the nations of the earth. None of your men or women will be childless, and, and your livestock will bear young. And the Lord will protect you from all sickness. He will not let you suffer from the terrible diseases you knew in Egypt, but He will inflict them on all your enemies. You must destroy all the nations your Lord God hands over to you. Show them no mercy, and do not worship their gods, or they will trap you. Perhaps you will think to yourselves, how can we ever conquer these nations? that are so much more powerful than we are. I wonder if Solomon was thinking that. I think he was. I think he was using human wisdom. Verse 18, But don't be afraid of them. Just remember what the Lord your God did to Pharaoh, <laughs> to Egypt again, and to the, all the land of Egypt. Remember the great terrors the Lord your God sent against them. You saw it all with your own eyes. And remember the miraculous signs and wonders in the strong hand and powerful arm with which he brought you out of Egypt. The Lord your God will use the same power against all the people you fear. And then the Lord your God will send terror to drive out the few survivors still hiding from you. No, do not be afraid of those nations, for the Lord your God is among you, and He is great and awesome God. The Lord your God will drive those nations out ahead of you, ahead of you little by little. You will not clear them away all at once. Otherwise, the wild animals would multiply too quickly for you. But the Lord, your God, will hand them over to you. Patience and trust in the Lord. He will do it. He will throw them into complete confusion until they are destroyed. He will put their, he will put their kings in your power, and you will erase their names from the face of the earth. No one will be able to stand against you, and you will destroy them all. You must burn their idols in fire, and you must not covet the silver or gold that covers them. You must not take it 
or it will become a trap to you. Solomon built more physical wealth than any other king. And as you read on, you'll see that the kingdom of Israel becomes divided among, under his leadership. You must not take it or it will become a trap to you, for it is detestable to the Lord your God. Jesus said, you can only serve one master. You will serve God or you will serve money. Scripture also says the love of money, not money. Money is a tangible thing. It means nothing. The love of money is the root of all sin. That covetousness that we have in our heart. The covetousness that when Eve saw the fruit, it was desirable to her and also she could gain wisdom from it. <laughs> Man's wisdom, not God's wisdom. It is detestable to the Lord your God. Verse 26, do not bring any detestable objects into your home. For then you will be destroyed just like them. You must utterly detest such things, for they are set apart for destruction. I don't think Solomon saw that that day. I hope you can see that by reading about him and his time with his dad, who was a man after God's own heart, but still did things that have consequences. All sin has consequences. It's what nailed Jesus Christ to the cross. So in 1 Kings 3, 3, it says, Solomon loved the Lord. Yes, he did. And followed all the decrees of what, though? His father, David. Did you catch that when you read that? That's like a total contradiction to there. David had a good heart. The Bible says it. Christ comes from their lineage. I don't know if you realize it or not either, but Adonai might have been the last remaining son alive of David's. His children went to the grave when he did. David had 20, 21 children. We don't know if the child that he lost, that God took at seven days after his adulterous affair with Bathsheba, is counted in that number or not. But you can count 20 names don't know if they named that child or not. And here he is at his deathbed, and Solomon kills off the last remaining child of David's. What a tragedy. What if you would have simply done what is printed in God's Word and lived up to it, and chose that day what was pleasing to you, what you wanted to do, what was in your heart to serve the gods of the other people, the idols of this world, or to love the Lord your God and serve Him only. As for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Maybe I'm just being holier than thou today. So let's go look at Jesus' words. Matthew chapter 5, Sermon on the Mount. When the crowds gather all around and Jesus tells them all these things, and you, read, you could spend years just on the Sermon on the Mount studying it. In verse 17, Don't misunderstand why I have come. I did not come to abolish the law of Moses or the writing of the prophets. No, I came to accomplish their purpose. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, and they will, not even the smallest detail of God's law will disappear until its purpose is achieved. Without the law, Paul said he wouldn't even know how filthy and degenerate, lost and destitute he was. And he didn't have that problem as you're reading in Scripture till he got, he said, number one, number two, till he got to number ten, thou shalt not covet. And it blew him away. Points back to if we had done commandment number one, we would have never done the others in the first place. And David could not mark some of those off for sure. Verse 19, so if you ignore the least command and teach others to do the same, because that's what you're doing with your children. I told you last week when we went to that unaltered conference that when they interviewed the children, they said their parents were the biggest contributing factor to the decisions that they made, good or bad. And when their parents refused to talk to them, when their parents gave them mixed signals by saying one thing and doing another, 
then that led them to making the wrong decisions. They wanted to find out from their parents. No, duh, that's the way God made them. Children are a blessing and a heritage from the Lord to train them up in the ways of righteousness. So if you ignore the least commandment and teach others to do the same, you will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But, complete opposite, anyone who obeys God's laws and teachings, they will be called the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. But I warn you, unless your righteousness is better than the righteousness of the teachers of the religious laws and the Pharisees, I'll remind you again, in that day they were the deacons and elders of the church. Is that okay to say without being too offensive? They were the ones that you would go to to really find out the truth because your life seemed to pattern after and you seemed to know what God's law said. Let's look at Paul. He persecuted and killed Christians because of what he thought the law said. But his heart was far from God. And then God used him in a mighty way. So look at all these people that made all these mistakes and know that you have the Spirit of God living inside of you where you don't have to make these same mistakes with your children. I warn you, unless your righteousness is better than the righteousness of the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. You have heard that our ancestors, what our ancestors were told. You must not murder. If you commit murder, you are subject to judgment. Got it. I understand that. But some of us also think, well, God will forgive us for those sins because He forgave David and Bathsheba. He did. He will forgive you for all sins. Jesus Christ's blood covers all sin. But it doesn't mean there are not consequences. And as we're seeing, these consequences continued down the family lineage of David, and they affected Israel. When, uh, drawing a blank, who was the handsome son of David? Absalom, thank me. I was just drawing the blank there. When he tried to take over his father's kingdom, I think I have the number right. You can go back and check me and you tell me next week. Then I know you checked if the number's wrong. 70,000 Israelites died during that because a son tried to take over his father's throne because he coveted it. Wow. Our sins have consequences. So Jesus says, yeah, you're subject if you commit murder. But, verse 22, I say to you, if you are even angry with someone, you are subject to judgment. You better get rid of it. If you call someone an idiot, you are in danger of being brought before the court. And if you curse someone, you are in danger of the fires of hell. Did you read your reading this week? If you did, you read Psalm 117. Did you notice something? It has two verses. It's the shortest chapter in the Bible. What's the longest chapter in the Bible? What's sandwiched right in between 117 and 119? 118. Which happens to be the middle of the Bible. And the middle verse of the Bible is Psalm 118.8. Okay? Now you can say there weren't chapters and stuff, and yet we can argue about all that. But in your modern Bible, Psalms 118.8, the middle of the Bible says this, It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in humans, created things. So now you're to what I titled the sermon. That fear leads you to wisdom, which leads you to God's love, which is so great that I can trust Him in any circumstance. Psalms 118 verse 4 says, Let all who fear the Lord repeat this. His faithful love endures forever. Verses 5 through 8 say, In my distress I prayed to the Lord, and the Lord answered me and set me free. The Lord is for me, so I will have no fear. What can mere people do to me? Yes, the, the Lord is for me. He will help me. I will look in triumph at those who hate me. It is better to take refuge in the Lord to trust in people. Do you trust in the Lord? Psalm goes on to say, The Lord is my strength and my song. He has given me victory. Verse 15, Songs of joy and victory are, su are sung in the camps of the godly. That's when we get together at church. We take all this victory that we have in Jesus and bring it together and really celebrate. 
The strong right arm of the Lord has done glorious things. The strong right arm of the Lord is raised in triumph. The strong right arm of the Lord has done glorious things. God does them all, not us. I will not die. Instead, I will live to do what? To tell what the Lord has done. The Lord has punished me severely. Uh-oh, okay. But he did not let me die. Open for me the gates where the righteous enter, and I will go in and thank the Lord. These gates lead to the presence of the Lord, and the godly enter there. Jesus said, if you hear my voice, you'll enter in. He also said that gate is small, narrow, and harder than a camel to pass through the eye of a needle. Few find it, but many on that day cry out and say, Lord, Lord, we knew you. And he says, no, I didn't know you. Depart from me. On that day there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth because there's nothing then that can be done about it. Verse 21, I thank you for answering my prayers and giving me victory. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. You get that from the songs today? Does that sound familiar? Well, it's Jesus' words. <laughs> That he's, well, it's not Jesus' words. It's whatever author says it. I don't remember where that's quoted in the Bible. But says that Jesus Christ is that stone that is rejected. The psalm goes on to say in verse 28 and 29, You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His faithful lo love endures forever. And we have Psalm 119. And no, I'm not going over Psalm 119. You're thinking, is he going to go over that? <laughs> Longest chapter. If you didn't know this, if you didn't study, it's 176 verses, lines, okay? It has 22 sections. Each section is the first to the last in order, letters of the Hebrew alphabet. It's a or, or, song in such order and complexity, eight lines each. Because God is such a God of order, not chaos. And you were designed to follow after His orderly plan for you, even in a sinful world. What the song does say is 25 times the Hebrew word for law is used. 24 times the word, the word for God's spoken word is used. 23 times the word for judgment is used. 23 times the word for testimonies is used. 22 times the word for commandments is used. 21 times the word for statues is used. 21 times the word for precepts is used. Are you seeing a pattern here? This is God's written word to you. His instruction book. His love letter. You're not going to get it by doing this. You're going to get it by reading and meditating and learning who God is and learning His love, learning to fear Him, learning to love Him, learning to trust Him. Coincidentally, you'll read Song of Songs today if you're following along and you'll see all this passionate love that you have no idea what it's even talking about. But hopefully it'll get you to think, wow, maybe it's about how much God loves me. So I hope you're reading. I hope you will. I am going to finish this with some verses from Psalms 119. Look in your bulletins. It's in there. I put it in a prayer form. You can repeat it with me if you'd like. And then we're going to see the video on Song of Songs to help you. And then Debbie will close us out. But I made this a prayer. Open my eyes to see the wonderful truths in your instructions. Give me understanding and I will obey your instructions. I will put them into practice with all my heart. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. You are my refuge and my shield. Your word is my source of hope. Your word is a lamp to guide my feet and a light for my path. Turn my eyes from worthless things and give me life through your word. I am determined to keep your decrees to the very end. This is how I spend my life obeying your commandments. I hope that is your prayer. It is my prayer and it is my prayer for you.
this is the greatest song of all songs. Then we're told in the first line that his song of songs is of song, which could mean that he is the author, his name doesn't get in the book after all. But as you read the poems, you discover that the main voice is that of a woman called the Beloved. And while there is also a male voice, it does not seem to be Solomon. Solomon is mentioned at the time in the poem, but he's never a speaker. And you do have to admit, Solomon is a very odd candidate as the author of this book, given the fact that he has seven wives. For the lovers in the Song of Songs, they are the only ones in the world for each other. So the of Solomon likely means in the wisdom, the tradition of the song. He was known for his wisdom, his poetry, his love of learning about every part of life. And Solomon became the father of wisdom literature in Israel. And so his legacy is here carried on through a collection of love poems that explores the human experience of love and sex and life. The opening poem is to the basic theme of this book. We hear the voice of the young woman who delights in her man, a shepherd. Now she's not married to him yet, but it becomes clear that they're engaged and they cannot wait to be together. From the introduction of the poem, we we'll flow back and forth from the woman's voice to the man, shifting from the season to the scene without any kind of clear linear sequence or storyline. The poems move in these symphonic cycles of key images and ideas we believe in So, one of the basic themes you might imagine is the intense desire that this couple has for each other, expressed through their constant seeking and finding. So, after the opening poem, they're separated but on the hunt for one another. So, the woman calls out, or she'll wake up from a dream, or go looking for her lover, and more than once, they'll find each other. Race, and then right when things start to get a bit racy, the scene will suddenly end, and the new one will start. They're separated, looking for each other, and on it goes. Another repeated theme is the joy of the couple's physical attraction to one another. So multiple times, they'll pause and describe each other with these elaborate metaphors. And here, it's very helpful to know that these images and metaphors of human poetry are not primarily visual. If you try and paint a picture of these people based on the metaphors, you will end up with something that looks very, very strange. What you're supposed to do is reflect on the meaning of these images as they relate to the man. So you'll read through the poetic cycles, and the tension will keep building in their desire and joy and attraction. And this spiraling repetition is a poetic way of heightening and focusing on the mystery and power of sexual love. It all comes together in the conclusion, which pauses to summarize what these poems are all about. Love is as strong as death. Its passions are as severe as the its flashes are on fire, a divine flame. Many waters cannot extinguish love. Rivers cannot sweep it away. If one were to give all the wealth of one's house for love, he would be up to his The poem highlights the power and the intensity of love, how it's both beautiful but also dangerous. Like fire, love can destroy people if it's abused or be life giving. Ultimately, love expresses the insatiable human longing to know and be fully known and desired by the love. Love is one of the most transcendent and mysterious experiences in human life. And as a part of the Bible's wisdom tradition, this book says it's a gift from God. After this, there's an odd poem about Solomon trying to do what the previous poem just said was impossible, to buy love. The woman rejects Solomon's offer, and then the book concludes with the man and the woman separate once more on the hunt for each other. He calls to hear her voice, she begs him to run away with her, and that's how the book ends. It's totally open-ended. But that's a lot like love, which never truly concludes, because there's always more to discover and pursue in your beloved. And so true love has no ending, and neither does it. Now through history, the big question raised by the Song of Songs is, what on earth is love poetry doing in the Bible? There have been three main interpretations of this book throughout history. In Jewish tradition, it's been read as an allegory, each character a symbol. So the woman is Israel, the man is God, and their love is a symbol of the covenant between God and Israel made at Mount Sinai and giving them before. This view flowed into the Christian tradition, but the characters were swapped. So it's about Christ's love for his people, the church. And this interpretation was inspired by Paul's words in Ephesians. Five, that a Christian husband's love for his wife is a symbol of Christ's love for the church. What's interesting is that in the last hundred years, archaeological discoveries among Israel's ancient neighbors in Egypt and Babylon has turned up all kinds of ancient love poetry that's very similar in language and imagery to the Song of Songs. We 
see that love poetry was a meaningful part of Israel's cultural environment, which has led most scholars today to view the Song of Songs as what it presents itself to be, an arrangement of Israelite love poetry reflecting on the divine right of love. But that doesn't mean that it's only ancient love poetry. There's a key feature of these poems that sticks out when you read them as a part of the Old Testament, and that's the overwhelming use of garden imagery. There are powerful echoes of the Garden of Eden and the idyllic scene between the married couple in the early chapters of Genesis. So the image of the man and the woman naked and vulnerable, but completely unified and safe with one another, this resonates in the background of the Song of Songs. It's as if in these poems we are witnessing the love of a couple whose relationship is untainted by selfishness and sin. And so ultimately the song holds out a hope that even though our own relationships are so often distorted by selfishness, love is a transcendent gift. And it's meant to point us to something greater, to the gift of God's love that will one day permeate 